Hi, I'm Chris Hoffman, and we're going to talk about services, specifically how to move from a seemingly intractable monolith um, to an ecosystem of services that you can operate well and sustainably. Um, I work at Optoro. We're an e-commerce firm uh, headquartered in DC. Uh, the only thing that's interesting about us is how we source uh, our inventory. We aggregate retail returns. So if you're Best Buy or you're a Target or some other major retailer, returns are annoying. Uh, what we do is we take those uh, that return merchandise off your hands, we test and grade um, everything that comes through our warehouse, uh, and we figure out whether, it's based on the client's recovery goals, whether we should resell it individually or resell it in bulk or donate it or recycle it. Um, uh, then we sell, we sell stuff on a variety of online marketplaces, Amazon, Best Buy, eBay, um, our own uh, marketplace, Blink.com. Things ending in queue will, be, will, will happen again. I don't. Even after five and a half years, I don't know why we end things in queue. We just, we just do. Um, that's about all you'll need to know about the business model. Uh, so I've been out tour for five and a half years. We've, uh, we still have a monolith, but we're moving toward, we're, we're more and more moving towards um, a, a ecosystem of services around it. Um, and over that period of time, we've done several service projects. I've been involved in a bunch of them. They weren't all successes. Um, so what I'm going to do. Uh, today is talk about three of them. I'm going to tell you uh, what we were trying to do so you have enough context, uh, what we did wrong, what we did right, and then we're going to finish the talk, or I'm going to finish the talk, by uh, giving you some advice on, how to, on, on what to do before uh, you start doing any service projects, how to approach your first service projects. So that's d different than the ones that will come after. Um, and then how to operate an ecosystem of them uh, without having a bad time. So... Um, I started in 2012, but our first, and, and I walked into a company that was already trying to figure out how do we, how do we break apart our monolith. Like this, these were conversations that were already happening um, when I got there. We didn't actually give it a go uh, until, until 2013. We started with um, Auth because Auth's easy, right? So, <laughs> yeah, no, not so much. Um, with any multi-tenant software, uh, auth is never just permissions. It's always more than permissions. Um, in our case, specifically uh, authorization, uh, to authorize a request, we need to know not just what permissions a user has by way of what user group they're in, but also who they're employed by and what warehouse uh, they're assigned to, because our, our software runs on a hardware that we provide in, in our um, clients' warehouses, um, which presents an immediate problem for extracting things to an auth service. Um, it's really easy uh, to see that the user user group permission model cluster is going to be owned by auth and it isn't going to be owned by inventory anymore. But then you have this hanging relationship across a network boundary um, because auth still needs to know the client and warehouse to authorize a request. But, that, the, but those are core models to inventory. Like it's an inventory management system. Warehouse is kind of a central concept. Um, so we were, we were a bit at a loss. Um, and we didn't really know as much um, about... Uh, distributed systems in general, uh, as we as we do now, so we didn't really solve this uh, data sharing problem. Uh, we just kind of punted on it. So whenever inventory wanted to authorize a request, it would make a request to auth, and then auth. So we go, hey auth, can is this person allowed to do this? And then auth would ask inventory, inventory, where do they work again? And um, except it had to be a different inventory because in stage, we actually completely locked up our application. See, if you block a web request to do a thing that requires making a web request to the first thing, you do enough web requests at the same time and suddenly your service doesn't work anymore. Um, so yeah, we, we learned that from production, kind of. Um, that inventory then returns the information to auth, and then auth gives inventory a yay or a nay. A uh, big problem with this, um, and the reason we eventually uh, stopped doing this project, was that this introduced um, um, unacceptable latency into into our system. This is just the start of a request, and we've we've turned something that went from zero uh, network transactions into two or network requests into two. Um, and and like I said, this is just the start of the request. The rest of it, you still have to like ship the unit or or test and grade an item. Um, and and we were just not we were not okay even with the dedicated inventory instances of the um, of the performance penalty here. So we so we can the project. So it's all well and good for me here to sit up here and, and, and tell ghost stories and have animal pictures and diagrams. But if if you are if you if y'all aren't actually learning something from it, then it's kind of a waste of time. Fortunately, 
as I mentioned, we messed up lots of stuff, and, and there's lots of things you can learn so that you'll make different mistakes, because that's the goal. Um, the first takeaway, uh, and the thing we notice immediately when trying to pull data out of a, of a monolith is that callbacks are not your friend. Um, they, they're kind of raison d'etre is to hide code from you, and if they're hiding code that only changes that model, mm, I don't like it, you know, but may, maybe it's okay in your applications. Active Record makes it really easy to, to touch related models, like that's its job. Um, and if your callbacks, which are hidden from you, are touching related models and you have to try to extract those related models from your, from your database, that gets really frustrating, like hair pullingly frustrating very quickly. Um, after this, uh, basically after this project, um, at Optora we just basically don't write Rails callbacks anymore. Um, we have other patterns for um, linearizing uh, persistence actions, um, and we try to get rid of the callbacks we've still got um, whenever we can. So I highly recommend that you do this. The one thing I will say in, in, in the defense of callbacks is that they do transaction management for you, which is a good thing. All the, um, with the exception of the before, the before transaction, the after transaction callback, all the callbacks related to a particular save will happen in a transaction. So they'll happen, they will either happen atomically or not happen atomically. You won't have some of them happening, some of them not happening. This is actually really good behavior. And you should, and you should one, get rid of callbacks, and two, um, recreate that behavior yourselves. Um, I'm not going to say that like, you should do this or you're a bad developer if you're not, because I, I really don't like people getting up on stage and saying that, especially white men, because it generally comes from a place of toxic gatekeeping, so I won't, but I will say that Transa the understanding transactions and transaction isolation isn't going to get less important the more services you have. And the better you understand these things, the nicer, t uh, the, you will have a better time when you get more services. So even if you have callbacks though, or even if you have gotten rid of all your callbacks, um, data sharing is still hard. How do, you, how do you figure out where shared models go? Um, you know, wh which, which of your services that needs a model owns that model? Um, and like I said, we, we kind of punted on that and had to spin up a second monolith just for, just for fun. Um, and there are, some, there are some strategies you can use. You can think about sharing a database, but okay, so you've got two apps writing to, a, writing to one database. The problem with, with this is that no matter which app you are, the other app is evil and doesn't share your, and doesn't share your values, i.e. your validations, and will corrupt your data out from under you, so that, that's a bad idea. Um, there's a lot of other strategies, I'm not gonna go into them. Um, but the, 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 the one thing that we should have done, and we didn't realize this until like years later, like I said, after we started uh, learning more about distributed systems in general. Um, and you are building a distributed system when you are, when you are embarking on um, uh, a service project. Um, we don't generally think of like Ruby having a big uh, presence um, in, in distributed systems, but like that's what you're building. Um, so this is, this is what we should have done with the benefit of hindsight. So I said warehouse and client didn't belong in inventory. Yeah, so that's a lie. They, they pretty much did. Uh, or they didn't belong in auth. Um, they, they pretty much did. Um, the, the right move here is to, um, is to have auth be, uh, is to have auth be own warehouse and client. Um, and the way that would work would be auth and inventory, they're on their own apps, they've got their own databases. And auth now services requests, or auth now services requests for client creation, for warehouse creation, and user creation. That actually creates this nice UX, um, US, UX and request flow because you're creating the client and then you're creating their warehouses and then you're creating their users all in one place. So that's, that's a nice hierarchical um, setup. But inventory still needs th that information because it has to service requests about, I'm gonna scan this unit in and if inventory goes, that warehouse is not a place, I don't know what's going on, 404, um, then that's unacceptable uh, for our users. So what we need auth to do is auth to tell inventory um, every time it gets uh, a new warehouse or a new client, or any time a warehouse or a client are changed in a certain way, or any time warehouses or clients remo are removed. That one's especially important. We want inventory to freak out if uh, people who are no longer on contract are still using our software. Um, so Auth says, hey inventory, we signed these new clients. They've got these warehouses. Don't freak out when they try to scan warehouses, or try to scan units in at those locations. And inventory says, thanks, 200 okay. I really appreciate you looking out for me like that. Um, you might think of this as, as data replication or, or, or similar to caching. I tend to not um, uh, like those words for, for this application because those, uh, they imply a degree of sameness um, and, and, and the data doesn't need to be the same in, in, in all these places. Um, basically this is, 
Uh, if you were here for the previous talk, this is uh, pretty much the most, the most primitive example of event sourcing you can get. Um, but the data doesn't need to be the same. Uh, if we take another example, um, uh, shipping and accounting. Both shipping and accounting need to understand the concept of unit, uh, but they have very different requirements for what that means. Accounting doesn't need to know how much a unit weighs, because it doesn't care, and shipping doesn't know how, need to know how much we charge the client for the unit, because it doesn't care. But they both need a concept of unit. Um, so the, 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 the general pattern we do now is for every model that we want to share between multiple services, we pick um, a service, usually at the start of the life cycle. You'll, you'll know where. Um, because you understand the life cycle of your models, um, to be the origin service for that model. So in, so in, our, in our auth case, um, auth is the origin service for users, for, and more importantly, for warehouses and clients, in our example. And what that means is that um, any other service that's not the origin service, we'll call them downstream, um, can have warehouses tables. But all of those tables have to have an origin ID column that is essentially a foreign key constraint across a network to the ID column in, in the auth tables, in the auth services warehouses table. The, your origin service for a particular model is the only one that doesn't have to have an origin ID. Put it put a different way, it's the only one that gets to make globally system-wide new records. Every other service gets to make locally new records, but they're a reflection or a view of or a representation of records you've already got um, in the entire system. Um, and they won't always contain data that was present in the originating system. In our, in our shipping example, shipping's gonna make a call out to FedEx or, or, um, or UPS or whatever shipping provider we have, and it's gonna write down a weight in the database which will not have been present um, when the unit was received, and that's fine. Um, the, so the takeaway there is if you need to share data, broadcast it. Um, don't try to sync it, don't try to share a database. Tell people about, what happen tell people about what's happening, tell your dependent services about what's happening. Um, so we, we, we did fail. Uh, we learned a lot of things like two or three years down the line, but that, that service did not make it into production. One of the other lessons we took from that was it was too big. We started, we were too ambitious, uh, and, and the whale killed us. Um, so the thing we did uh, the, the very next year is try to go as small as possible. We said, what, what's, what, what, what can we do that's, that's very small? Uh, and we, we, we uh, looked at product photo processing. So uploading, resizing, and cropping of images. And if you're thinking that that sounds like something a background worker can do, just hold that thought. <laughs> um, so we had this other technical difficulty that was present in the auth service as well, but it doesn't make, it doesn't make pedagogical sense to talk about it there, so I'm talking about it here. Um, you're all familiar with HTTP. It's a really great protocol. Yeah, yeah. Um, you get a client, you get a service, you make a request to the client, or you make a request to the service, Jesus. Uh, and the service gives you a response, and everything's great. Yeah, we didn't want to do this. This is, this is old and busted. We're a, we're, a, we're a startup disrupting things that have no business being disrupted. Um, so, so we had this vision. Like, there are reasons for it, but they're not amazing. We had this vision of the way services were going to work at Optoro, like five-year plan type shit, type stuff. Um, and instead of using a decentralized synchronous protocol, which is what HTTP is, we were gonna use a centralized asynchronous protocol. There's a couple reasons we thought this. I won't go into them in the talk. If you wanna ask me about them later, I'll be happy to tell you about them. It will cost you a drink. Um, <laughs> um, but we wrote a rack server that spoke AMQP so that we could use our, our, our current Rails apps and just pick, stick them onto this protocol. We also wrote a gem called AMQ Party, which, uh, as you can guess, mimics the semantics and interface of HTT Party. And here's what it did. And, yeah. Uh, so we got a client and a service. Uh, and because the client and service can't talk to each other directly, uh, the service has a request channel that it's going to read inbound messages from. And because the service can't respond to the client directly, the client and the service have a paired response channel that the client is going to read inbound messages from. It's great. Um, so the client, so AMQ party publishes a request message. Notice, not sends a request, publishes a request message. It's very dangerous territory we're in here to the service request channel, which the service, which our, our rack AMQP server is pulling for, and then it invokes your Rails application, gets the response, publishes a response message to the paired client service response channel, and the an AMQ party, as soon as it published the request message, spins up a polling loop on that paired channel and, and, pull, publish, and uh, gets your message. So this is a really complicated technical diagram. I'm gonna show you one that's much simpler and conveys the same information. So 
even with all this nonsense, we did it. We like we 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 made a service, except not really, because it still used inventory's database, so you can't really call a service. Um, and as previously mentioned, those of you who are like, that sounds like a background worker, we're correct. We put a lot of dumb infrastructure in front of a background worker. Um, so the thing we learned is that adding is easier than extracting. And it would have been even easier if we didn't do all that nonsense. Um, if you're going to do, like I already said that, that data sharing is really hard. In fact, it's one of the two hardest problems you're going to encounter when doing service uh, ecosystem work. We'll come to the, the, the second hardest problem later in the talk. Um, so for your first service, you should probably do something that involves as little data extraction as possible. You should add, you should add functionality to your, to your monolith um, in the form of a service instead of extracting data, or instead of extracting uh, functionality. Our problem was that it was so small that no one cared very much or even knew about it. I had to be reminded like three weeks ago that this was a thing we ever did actually. Um, so yeah. And the problem with this is that if you are doing, if you are thinking about having a service ecosystem or microservices as they're sometimes called, not sometimes, they're mostly called that, they're only sometimes called services, um, that is an inherently political project. You are reshaping the way engineering will be done at your organization. and. Therefore, you have to understand and, and, and deal with political realities. And one of them is this concept of a win. And you can have an engineering success, but if it's not a win, because, if it, doesn't Im because it doesn't make someone's life better, and it's not a visible win, you're probably not going to have enough political capital to when, the next when you say, hey, I want to do the next one. Wasn't the first one so great? What first one? We don't, I, don't remember, I don't remember seeing this. You're probably not going to be allowed to continue. So um, for... for if you, for your people's first service, I would definitely recommend that you start with something something that will have impact, um, that will that will make people's lives better. That like, I don't know if the concept of like brand is 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 super um, applicable, but but something with, with impact that people will notice. Um, and for just do the simplest thing you possibly work. If you have a, if you have service to service communication, just use HTTP. HTTP is the best HTTP that I know of. Um, I, I would not recommend other non HTTP HTTP replacements. Um, you want to be like Drake in your approach to software architecture? You want to shun and be afraid of reproducing synchronous protocols with, de with asynchronous ones, and you want to think that just using the synchronous protocol is the best thing you could do. The man's very, very uh, wise about software architecture. I think it's the jacket, actually. I really want that jacket. So um, there, were project, there were service projects that we did uh, after that, but, uh, or there was one service project that we did after that, um, but it was uh, aborted because a wild deadline appeared and we weren't able to make it a service. Um, but the next actual service project that, that we could do was uh, bulk sales pricing in 2015. So we've always done bulk sales um, at Uptoro, uh, but it's always been a two to three person team who works in the warehouse and is aware of fluctuations in our inventory and aware of the, the landscape for buyers and sellers of this stuff. And they basically call people up and say, hey, so I got a thousand laptops of varying qualities. What do you give me for them? Um, and this is really profitable for us. And, and also, it's very much in demand. They would call us back like, you know, half a year later and be like, do you have any more laptops? I'm making this sound much seedier than it is. Like, no, literally, zero percent of our inventory has ever been sourced off the back of a truck. Um, I'm serious, it hasn't. Um, so in late 2015, we launched bulk.com. There's the, the cues again. I don't get it. Um, this one at least makes sense. I don't know what Blink is. Bulk is obviously like, yeah, bulk sale, good. Um, Maybe next, maybe next uh, product will have a word that describes the thing and also is spelled correctly. Who, who could tell? Um, so before, when we did, when, we, when it was just a, a, a humans doing uh, the pricing, um, or before it was just humans doing the pricing, and that doesn't scale up to the like to the scale of a marketplace. We could add more humans, but the humans that we had don't don't scale. Um, so it was uh, my job to uh, work with our data science team. They had a pricing model um, that, they, that they were using based on uh, a historical bulk, bulk pricing data. Oh, and it's my job to make that accessible to our Ruby code. And so my, my lead and I got to talking and we were like, do we need this data in the monolith? And the answer was no, we didn't. Um, and so we wanted, that, that was a perfect opportunity for another service. And the problem was when we had done auth and when we had done photos processing, we, our infrastructure team, Yes, we have an infrastructure team. Um, had done the provisioning and configuration and setup and creating backups and logging and metrics and all that stuff um, for Rabbit for our um, 
for our, for our janky ass rack server, ra uh, rack server um, for the workers for for everything. And they were doing, and they were busy doing bulk.com because that was client, that was public facing, and that's what they should be doing. So I said, I can do it. Um, and uh, you know, I, I'd been talking to them a little bit, and they didn't have like a checklist, but the standard procedure was we use Chef Cookbook, we, we use cookbooks for for configuration, we use Terraform for provisioning, we use you know data bags for for uh, for secrets, and that, that that seemed to me like yeah, it's Ruby files and JSON. How hard can it be? So, yeah, uh, it took me seven. We had a, we had a deadline of nine weeks. We had to we had to be ready for uh, regression testing for bulk.com, um, and we we made it. We we it, I took seven days to write the service. A really easy service. And there was a redesign in the middle. I could have done it in three if I wasn't. Um, and it took me seven weeks to learn a thimble size amount of each of those. And if you will notice, the last thing has an ampersand on it indicating that this goes off the page. It does. Um, the problem with this is one of the motivating factors for the overall uh, service project at Uptoro is that we want the, we want the time between, or we want, we want to go from a developer going, that piece of functionality doesn't go there, to having a deployable prototype in as little time as possible. And seven weeks is no one's idea of as little time as possible. Um, and there were, and the reason for that was there were too many things to learn. However, we also had the solution at the same time. The reason it took me seven weeks to learn all these things, and not like two years, um, is that we had an infrastructure team, and they had already figured out patterns for all these stuff. I didn't have to look at all the uh, at the various common logging formats and figure out which one was a, was a, was a fit for us. They had already done that. We used Logstash. I didn't have to research all the popular health check frameworks and figure out which one was, was, was gonna be the best fit for us. They had already done that. We used Nagios. And we as Rails developers understand that these kinds of conventions are one of the most empowering things that you can have. Like this is what makes Rails, Rails. The other thing that we noticed, um, and this is gonna sound a little patronizing at first and it's not meant that way, um, is that I was able to operate my application. Like previously we had relied on, um, um, on our infrastructure team for not, not like code level, um, not, not business logic uh, bugs, but for, for database performance stuff, for, 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 for tuning, for that kind of thing. And they were busy doing bulk.com, and there were, there were a couple times where I was actually able to respond to uh, incidents in production using their pattern, but just running it myself, which was very empowering. And, it, and we came away with the conclusion that if we're gonna have more services, developers should um, operate the applications they deploy. They should be responsible for the production behavior of the code they put into production. And the reasons for that are, are twofold. Um, one, if you, if you have an infrastructure team, if you don't have an infrastructure team, there's only one reason, but if you do have an infrastructure team, um, they're already operating your, your, your infrastructure. Like whether it's databases or caches or Kafka or Rabbit or, or whatever, they're already doing their job. It's, 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 it's kind of, it's not really okay to ask them to operate, to also operate all the services you're about to start making. Um, and, and the second thing, uh, and this applies if, if you don't have an infrastructure team, is that our, our role as engineers is to deliver value to users through products. That's it, that's the whole job. And if that's the case, and I'm arguing that it is, um, then our job can't stop at merging to master and deploying. Or it has to extend beyond that into an understanding of how our systems operate in production, how our users encounter the code we deploy. Um, and if you're going to do that, you should have an answer to all of these questions um, at your organization. Um, again, having these conventions are super powerful. Whether you're, whether you're on a 24-7 um, uh, on-call rotation and you get the page at 4 a.m. and you're like, oh, what, what? or you get the page at 4 p.m. and you're not on an on-call rotation, you were just finished for the day and gonna do some PR review and then head home. You don't, you don't wanna get a page at either of those times. And, you, and when you do get that, you don't wanna have to figure out where logs are. You don't wanna have to ask a colleague, where are the dashboards for this again? Especially if it's 4 a.m., you just wanna know. So the way that our infrastructure team had already figured this out and had already provided, convention, had already provided production conventions for us, um, you'll want to do for your organizations. Um, and again, as Rails developers, we know the best thing you can do for a, product, for a convention is to wrap a tool around it. Um, you, want, you want to make it so that people can't forget to set up logging the right way or so that they can't mess up the way metrics are collected. 
Um, and whether that's a, a project skeleton repo that you clone and change all the names on, or a Rails application template that, um, that adds like 10 more initializers that set up logging and service discovery, sorry, and secrets um, the way your organization handles them, or you can do what we do and write a custom build and deploy tool um, that allows you to write a file uh, and press, well, write a, and type command and have uh, containers deployed into production in, in under two hours. Um, you can do that. I don't recommend doing that. We have our own reasons for doing that. One of them is that we deploy on a Solaris. If, you're, if you don't deploy on a Solaris, don't do this. Um, the deploy part is actually easy. Like deploy, yeah. deploy is commoditized at this point. Um, the build aspect, what, how to get the, not the secret sauce, but the production conventions that your organization will use, how you do logging, how you do all these things, um, and how to get them into your application, that's not commoditized, and it probably never will be, because you like, the, the conventions that you have are probably gonna be shared by such a small number of other organizations that, uh, that you can't get an ecosystem or a community around that. Who knows, maybe Rails 7 will just have all of those things in it, that would be wonderful. Um, so what, what can you do now? What can you, what can you learn from, from my pain um, and, and our pain, actually? It's not all mine. It's not just mine. Um, and, and take back to, to your organizations, whether they whether they're, uh, don't have any services or, uh, yearn for, or long for the days of a monolith when everything was in the same place. Well, if you don't have any services yet, number one thing I recommend is get rid of your active record callbacks. Uh, for, all, for all the reasons I mentioned earlier. They make it harder to pull data out of your monolith. Um, they hide code from you. Uh, they create semantic dis distinctions between bits of uh, persistence where there aren't any. Um, and they're just kind of bad. That said, you will have to roll your own transaction management, which isn't hard. You just do active record transaction base dot, or active record base dot transaction do, and you've got a transaction. Um, and it will behoove you to know about transactions and how to and how to wield them and when it's okay to loosen um, your consistency requirements to get more performance. If you're uh, if you're doing if you're just starting your first service, don't start by don't start with what we did with auth and, and have and have to pull models out of your monolith. Um, as I mentioned, the two hardest problems you'll come across are that shared models are really hard, and figuring out conventions for production isn't going to be hard, but it's going to be complicated. Um, and those are both hard problems, and I recommend only having to do one of them at a time. Uh, and to do that, you have to start with something um, that's, that adds functionality as opposed to extracts it. That said, pick something that people will notice. Um, this is a political project, again, and so if you want to um, continue doing it, uh, you should probably pick something that, that people notice um, and that you will be able to get momentum behind at your organization. Use boring technology. Don't. Don't be like Drake. Don't don't use don't use um, don't recreate uh, synchronous protocols with asynchronous ones. Um, use things that you can uh, that that you can uh, get people um, to support, or that you can actually Google for answers on the internet. Um, uh, once you have more than one service, um, or once you're past your your first service, and you maybe want to start extracting some data out of your monolith, um, don't don't try to share that data. Don't try to synchronize that data. Broadcast it. Um, pick, a, pick a service uh, that makes sense to be the origin service for that model, and everything else is downstream and only gets to create new, ver new local records of that model when the origin service um, says they can, basically. Um, and you, will, you, you should operate what you deploy. Developers should be responsible for the production behavior of code they put into production. Um, and to do that, you, it's, that's going to be lots easier if you have conventions for production. Figure out what, what makes sense for your organization in terms of how to, all the tools you need to respond um, to, to production incidents. And then make, write, a tool, write a build tool that enforces doing so, so that you don't have to, that, so that you can't forget or, or can't mess up um, configuring these things. You've been a, you've been a great audience. Uh, I really hope you've gotten something out of, out of me basically going, you see this scar? You want to hear how I got it? Um, for, for as long as I have. Um, uh, do we, can we do questions or are we just not doing? What? Okay. We apparently can do questions, um, but if you have any other questions of, uh, of me and, or, or comments or observations, I will be happy to uh, take questions in the hallway track. I am unfortunately not a giant, uh, but I do have this ponytail, so um, if, if that helps you locate me, then I, I don't know. You're welcome, maybe. Hmm. Um, Anyway, thank you very much.